Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Neal, and I want to welcome you to Town Talks. Town Talks is a new program that we've launched this year to, to try to give uh, residents a chance to interact with some of our senior staff on, on, subject, on, on, on some subject matters that we think are important in the community, because we've been hearing from residents that they're important in the community. So tonight, we're, we're going to talk about public safety, and we have our two chiefs with us tonight. Uh, Dave Nelson is our, is our police chief. Dave started his career in Anoka County in 1989. He came to Edina in 1991. He's kind of worked his way up through being a traffic cop and detective, school resource officer through the ranks, and he was appointed uh, the chief in 2014. Uh, Chief Nelson uh, has a department with a, a, around a $14, $15 million budget and 83 full-time employees. Tom Schmitz is our fire chief. Uh, Tom started here in 1993. Uh, he's worked continuously since then, except for a brief break in, in 2012, where he went back to, uh, where he went to Eden Prairie and worked for a couple of years there, came back in 2014 when we appointed him chief. Uh, in addition to being the fire chief and, and all the fire suppression duties that you might think of a fire chief commanding, uh, Tom also uh, directs our building inspections group, our public health group, and our fire inspections. Tom's department has 76 total full-time employees and, and over a $12 million budget. So what we're going to do tonight is uh, have presentations from both of our chiefs. Following that presentation, uh, we'll do a little Q&A with our, with our audience and, and we'll Pose some questions, and we'll try to and we'll try to answer those questions, and we'll try to wrap this up around eight o'clock. So, with no further ado, I want to turn it over to our police chief, Dave Nelson. All right, I got a mic. <laughs> Good evening again, Dave Nelson, and I'm honored to be the chief of police in the city of Edina. Uh, like I said, I've been here since 1991, and and it's just been a great place to work ever since. So we're going to talk a little bit about calls for service. Back when I started in 1991, the population was 47,000, some odd number of people, and our calls for service were always right around 40,000 calls for service. And it stayed that way for many years. I've got uh, a chart up here where it has calls for service going back to 2008, and you can see 2008 was an easy number for me to start collecting the data from, so that's why we started there. But, uh, but the calls for service were just kind of lower 40s, upper 40s, lower 40s, just kind of go. Until about 2013 is when we saw all the redevelopment going on in Edina and the population started growing. As the population grows, then obviously our calls for service also grew. Um, you can see that we, we had a spike in 2017 of uh, over 70,000 calls. So when we uh, were looking at calls for service, uh, we did a public service uh, staffing study um, with a company called Novak, and they came back with some recommendations about adding officers. Um, and uh, when they did their study, they were studying uh, the information from 2013, 14, and 15, and that's where you can see where we started the dramatic calls for service increase in 16, 17, 18, and 19. We've tapered off a little bit. In this uh, study, we also had them look at the amount of time officers spend responding to and being on scenes of calls. So that's the chart on the right-hand side there. You can see in 2013, it's by minutes. We were over 300,000 minutes. And since 2013, that has been nothing but increasing all the way up to just under 700,000 minutes in 2019. When you look at that from 2013 to 2019, that's a 107% increase in the amount of time our officers are spending, responding to and being on calls for service. So even though our calls for service tapered down a little bit over the last two years, the demand time is continuing to increase. Part of that is uh, what type of calls for service are we going on? Um, the mental health calls is something that's very time consuming for our officers. Um, we have mental health calls on this next slide here. In 2015, the number's relatively low. 2015 was when we identified and started getting a lot of inquiries about, well, how many calls, how much time, and how many calls are you going on involving mental health? And we really didn't have a good way to track it in our current RMS system. Because a lot of times the calls would come in as welfare checks, they could come in as medicals, 
Um, they could come in as suspicious persons, um, and you know we'd respond to those, and they'd be labeled that. But then we'd go back and look at well, how many involved mental health interventions. We didn't have a good way of tracking that, so about midway through 2015, we started. So once we finished 2015, then in 16, 17, 18, you can see continuing to increase. 19, we had a little bit drop off there, but when we get uh, these um, mental health um, calls, it's not a one car call, it's usually two or three officers going, and they're spending a tremendous amount of time trying to handle, every, every call is gonna be different. And so I gotta figure out what's the best way to handle these. Um, some of the resources we've been able to, to use is, uh, is COPE, it's C-O-P-D, or P-E, I'm sorry. And COPE is for Community Outreach uh, Psychiatric Emergencies. It's a group that's put together by Hennepin County, and it is someone that we can call when we're tied up on these calls and we don't have enough for a hold, but somebody definitely needs some services and they need them sooner than later, we can actually call COPE and they have response teams that will come out 24 seven. So normally we're not gonna be able to, I'm sorry. Normally, can I have both on or? Okay. <laughs> normally, um, where was I? I'm sorry. Um, we won't be able to stay on scene until COPE gets there, but when they do get there, they can intervene more with the family and see what kind of services are available, and they can also do follow-up calls and come back to the residents in hopes that we don't get called back there. But um, like I say in 2015 was when we started tracking this. In 2014, when I became chief, and we first started seeing this um, the, the rise in the mental health calls, we came across this crisis intervention training. And in two, at the end of 2013, we sent two officers to it. They came back and it was amazing when they were to go on a mental health call, how effective they were at communicating and bringing a peaceful resolution and getting the person the services they need. So when I became chief in 2014, that was one of my first initiatives is I want all of our officers to go through this. Now it's a 40 hour class. It's offered a few times a year and we have to send people there. It's expensive. So it's a hit in our training budget, but to try to get people to be able to be off the regular schedule and the patrol schedule, we can only have a couple off at a time. So it wasn't easy just to send everybody to this 40 hour training. But what the 40 hour training brings us is uh, officers develop an understanding of the struggle on both sides when responding to a mental health crisis call. What I mean by that is years ago when I would respond and we'd get a mental health call, you know, we would just go and try and deal with the situation. And if somebody's not making sense in how they're communicating or they're being unrealistic, you know, we just tried to work our way through it and tried to get them to some services, get them down to uh, Hennepin County Medical Center or something like that. Today, now we sit back and we, we listen to them. And if they are hearing voices in their head, we don't discard that. We listen to them because in their mind they are hearing those. We're trying to be compassionate. We're trying to control the situation. We slow down and we can effectively communicate with people when they're in these crises. And better, I think we can bring a better resolution and we can give them the services they need sooner, although it takes time. A lot of time, if someone's in a real serious mental health crisis, we need to respond with several officers, we need to make the whole area safe for anyone who's around, and then we need to calm the situation down. As long as we can calm the situation down, I'm always confident we'll get a good resolution out of it. While they're at this training, they also have an opportunity to meet and interact with community mental health professionals. So these are people who do this full time. Police officers don't. And before we had this increase of calls, we didn't have much experience with it. So when we first started to get it, we were kind of on the job learning. And to be able to spend 40 hours with mental health professionals who are instructing this class and can tell us, you know, if you see this, it might be this. You might need to try this. If you try this type of communication and it doesn't work, try this and it has been very helpful. Um, we can learn a lot about more resources that were available, and then they do a lot of role playing throughout the entire 40 hour course. And uh, to see it, it's, it's great. When we measure, does this type of training work? Uh, the one thing that speaks volume to me is when people from our community 
call in and they thank the officers for responding to their residents, taking the time to listen to them and get them the resources they need. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to see our most recent Beyond the Badge, February 2020. If you haven't, I strongly recommend you do take a look at it. It's about four minutes long. But that was someone who was in a mental health crisis. And we ended up call, being called out there because he was texting that he was going to commit suicide. And when the officers arrived, he was confident that he could just get his way through it and get him to leave and he could do his own thing. But the officers wouldn't leave. And the officers were genuinely concerned about his welfare and genuinely concerned about getting him help. And that, it was at that time when he realized they're going so far above and beyond what their normal call of duty is. He was so impressed that he actually came in and, and did the little documentary on it. But he's not the only one who's called in. We've had several people call in, write letters, and expressing their appreciation for their officers to take the time. So in 2019, by the end of 2019, we're pretty much got all of our patrol officers through that training. A few officers left to go through, but uh, it's been a long, long deal, but well worth it. Um, next, we're going to talk about body cams, but I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm ready to go there. Yeah. Keeping on time. So body cams. People have had lots of questions on uh, body-worn cameras. We've been working on this for a good three years. So I think it's come more in the public attention, more in 2019. But this has been a process we've been looking at for a long time. Uh, we want to make sure we get the right body cam to meet our needs and to work with our systems. So when we were first started to think about looking at them, we had to look at our in-squad cameras that we currently have. We've had in-squad cameras since 2008. The in-squad cameras that we had at the time, you know, a few years back, um, really didn't meet our needs if we wanted to add body cameras because they didn't have body cameras. So we wanted to find a new vendor for our squad cars, get that up and running first. We went with uh, WatchGuard, and they also have a body cam that would meet our needs. So once we got all the squads integrated with the new in-squad system, and we got all the little glitches worked out on data storage and all that kind of stuff that goes with it, um, then we could start getting more serious about getting the body cams. So we got them into the community, or, uh, CIP budget for 2020. And right now, basically, what we're waiting on is WatchGuard is just revising and revamping their whole system and coming out with their latest, greatest. And we're hoping it will be available in May. So that's when we'll place our order to make sure we're getting the top of the line stuff. And hoping to implement uh, before the end of the year, but I'm hoping by summer to late fall. So but what will we use body cams for? Or talk about the in-squad videos. You know, we use them to collect evidence, document encounters, provide enhanced transparency and accountability. Adding the body-worn camera, I think, will just dramatically expand that capability. With the body camera, you know, our, our in-squad systems have been great. They work great on traffic stops. They got microphones on so they can hear the conversation going on with the driver. Um, but a lot of times when we have a major incident, or they get a chase and all of a sudden they stop and then the guy takes off running, the officer goes out of camera range, and I got nothing. You get his microphone for a little while till that goes out of range. But, but uh, so anytime the camera's always pointing out the front, anytime anything goes off to the side, we lose it. So with body cams, we're going to have that ability to, uh, to keep that camera running and collect uh, more evidence. And, and I just got to see where I'm going on. Okay. Going into our timeline, um, I don't know if anyone remembers, we had it on Better Together when we were collecting public input for our policy. It was in December of uh, 2019. And then January of 2020, we finalized the policy and it's been approved. And then mid-2020, like I say, we're hoping for May or June to be able to order and then get them fully operational before the end of the year. Um, body cams, we'll be using them basically to collect any type of evidence. Anytime there's an evidentiary reason to have it on, the officer will have it on. The list here of just some of the stuff will be for pursuits, traffic stops, investigative stops of a pedestrian, searches, seizures, and arrests, use of force, adversarial, hostile, or co confrontational encounters, any other activities likely to yield information having evidentiary value. So that will be our main use for them. Um, Trying to think of uh, anything else. 
with body cams. Uh, it, it, I think it will be great for the department to have them. Um, a lot of people have always questions, well, what do the officers think about getting body cams? Um, body cams, like I say, we've been talking for them for a few years now, and it was last year when officers were coming to my office saying, Chief, when are we getting body cams? Uh, so they want them, and we're going to get them for them. So that's about all I have on, on that. I can turn it over to the fire chief. Thanks, Dave. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Pull up my notes here. All right. I think you're going to hear some similarities uh, with uh, the fire department, as you heard from the police department, and kind of what they've been experiencing uh, with emergency responses. So, if we, as we look back at the data, um, I went back 24 years. We have data that goes back uh, farther than that, but 24 years ago, and you can kind of see um, how our business has been. And what's really quite interesting to me is, well, over that 24-year period, it was about a 65% increase in emergency responses. And when I say emergency responses, these are calls into 911 requesting fire or EMS response and that's most likely going to be a code three response, all right, lights and siren. So we started to see a, a significant increase in our response times right around the same time uh, Chief Nelson noted about 2013 is when we started to see it increase. And it was primarily on the EMS side of our business. So from 2013, our runs have increased by 35%. And from 2018 to 2019, we saw an additional 7.5%. So we've been seeing some pretty big jumps uh, each year. The thing that I found really interesting was in, from 1996 to the end of 2014, 19 years, we saw an increase of 1,000 emergency runs. From the beginning of 2015 to the end of 2018, that four year span, we had already jumped another 1,000 runs. So that's a pretty significant uh, increase in emergency responses in a very short period of time. And if that's the pace that we're going to be looking at uh, in the future, um, it's going to be some interesting situations for the fire department. So moving on to the next slide, we gather a lot of data. One of the things that we have to do as a fire department in the state of Minnesota is we have to uh, collect a lot of data, and that data moves on into the state of Minnesota, then off to a national database. The fire service is very good of, of tracking data. So this uh, map on, this, on the right side of the screen is a heat map, and these are generated from our records management system. And this shows emergency response intensity um, for all emergency runs in 2019. So that was roughly just over 6,300 runs. And you can see pretty clearly that the southeast quadrant is the biggest uh, piece of our business. And we break that out, and you can see that uh, in the southeast quadrant, that 51% of our runs are occurring down there. And how do we break up our quadrants? It's really simple. Um, Highway 100 separates east and west, and 62 separates north and south. So not all quadrants are created equal. And I think you can recognize that the southeast quadrant is the small, smallest quadrant of the four, and yet it is the busiest for us. And I think we all know why that is. Um, density is a big factor there. So I just want to hit the, the outside. We do a significant amount of runs outside of our community supporting the neighboring cities around us, just like they come back into our community and help us in times of need also. So we did a heat map just breaking out EMS. So in the fire department, that's, we can break this, our runs out into a lot of different categories, but two big pieces, how many ambulance runs are we going on and how many fire responses are we going on? And so that's what this, these two heat maps are breaking out. And as you look at it, the EMS looks a lot like the map we just saw, the overall response. EMS is the largest part of our business. 83% of our emergency responses, 5,220 last year of the 6,300 were for ambulance runs. So it looks very similar to the overall um, response map. But when we look at the fire map, you can kind of see 
things start to, to distribute a little bit throughout the city. And as I look at all those heat signatures throughout the city, those are all areas where we have businesses or multi-residential structures. So as you look at that, obviously the southeast quadrant is pretty evident, but you can see 60, uh, you can see Jerry's grocery store, um, 5250 Vernon, it's a multi-residential senior facility. I can see the high school on there. I can see um, 50th in France. Um, so all of those pop up, just kind of like what, what we were expecting. So, I'll catch up here on my notes. So we hired a company like, uh, well, this is not the Novak report, this is the Five Bugles design. This was a consultant that the fire department brought in to take a look at our response times and station location. And they looked at two and a half years worth of data. And as you look at their data, again, EMS and fire, very similar to the heat maps that we create from our records management system. There's nothing that's significantly different. Obviously, this is data over a two and a half year period uh, our heat maps were just looking at 2019, which is pretty consistent from year to year. Response times. So this is one area that we uh, pay close attention to and we try to make sure that um, we have uh, very good response times. Edina has excellent response times when we compare ourselves to neighboring departments. Obviously, a city that might have a volunteer fire department Minnetonka is an example, Eden Prairie is an example, Bloomington is an example. Their response uh, model is different than ours. Uh, they don't have full-time staff 24 hours a day, so a lot of their staff, when the call goes out, has to come from home, respond to the station, get in the truck, and then respond to the call. We have a full-time staff, so when the call comes out, we're able to uh, close that response window a lot quicker. So we're very proud of our response times, but we want to make sure we're paying attention to that and that our response times don't get away from us. But you can see our response times have been increasing over the last several years. And I anticipate that our response times are going to continue to increase for a lot of different reasons. Um, one, as we are going on more and more calls, our limited resources are tied up on those calls. So that makes us unavailable to respond to the next call, or it puts us out of position um, to respond to a call that might be in a different quadrant. We do mutual aid responses, so we might be out of the city assisting another community um, while we're waiting for our callback staff to come back in. Um, increased traffic, increased density, so with the increased density and increased height in our buildings, these response times are based on the time we are dispatched to the time the crew arrives on scene. It does not take into consideration the time from the curb to the time we're actually at the side of the patient or we're on the 14th floor of a kitchen fire on a high-rise building. None of that time is factored in. But we know that adds a lot more time to the equation. Um, and that can be anywhere from you know, a couple of additional 30 seconds to three, four, five minutes. Um, to muster all those resources from the truck and get them to the point of the incident to start taking care of the problem. Um, increased complexity of the call. Dave, uh, Chief Nelson already mentioned that. Um, we have seen a significant increase in our response to psychiatric calls. In 2011, we responded to 86, what would get classified in our RMSI or RMS as psychiatric emergencies, 86. Last year, we did over 246. And the NOVAC report showed that um, our average turnaround time on our emergency responses is about 37 minutes. There's a 33% increase when it gets classified as a psychiatric emergency. So almost 50 minutes we're spending additional time on these types of calls. And the reason for that is the complexity of these calls. A lot of times on the front end, we have to wait for the police to get in there and do their thing and calm the situation. And then when they're done with that, they'll transfer that patient over to us and then we will do the transport to the hospital. Part of that um, complexity is we have another component to psychiatric emergencies where a patient might get put on an emergency hold, a transport hold. That's where the police will put that person through a, a process that they have that the patient will get transported, transported to the hospital um, against their will, right? Because we have uh, a concern 
uh, for their safety. In 2011, we had 15 holds. Last year, we had, let me just quick find it, 242. So that is a 1,500% increase in transport holds. So that's, again, another reason why we are um, seeing an increase in our response times. Um, again, mutual aid calls, we do go to other cities primarily. We are um, going to more EMS mutual aid calls to our neighbors. We're supporting Hennepin County, Alina Ambulance, um, because this is not just happening in Edina as far as an increase in response. It's happening all over the metro. Um, ambulance runs are going up considerably throughout uh, the whole community. Uh, this is uh, from the Five Bugles design. This is their uh, response time analysis that they did for us. And you can see from that response time um, in the two station model, and you, um, you can look at the coloring there, but basically the, the, uh, the purple and the blue is a response time of uh, two to four minutes. And then as it gets further out, our response times uh, increase. One of the things that they were charged to do was uh, look at uh, moving some stations if possible, and then also adding some stations and how that would affect our response times. Station one, we're all familiar with station one on uh, Tracy and 62. Uh, this was built in 2008 and it's 34 square, uh, 34,000 square feet um, in size and it houses pretty much um, everything about our fire department, equipment, staff, uh, offices, that type of stuff. Station two, uh, that was built in 1996. It was built originally as a paramedic substation, uh, originally a power shift station, so just staffed Monday through Friday, eight to five. Um, and as things continued to grow in that uh, quadrant, um, we moved that station to a 24-hour station. It did not have dorm or sleeping quarters, so we made some makeshift dorms uh, upstairs. And um, so, and we only staff that station. The only fire response in the southeast quadrant is two paramedics. There is no fire response out of that station. So, and this truck is busy. Um, they're not in the station very often because they're out doing uh, ambulance runs. So when we look at the future, um, and this is from um, the Five Bugles design uh, recommendations, no change to station one, station two, move it a little bit further west and north um, to take a lot of that response um, um, into our community. We had a fair amount going to Richfield, but uh, we don't serve Richfield. Um, and that should happen soon. Um, that would be their recommendation. Make that a 24-hour station, um, a right around 20,000 square feet, three to four bays, uh, roughly two to four acres. I don't know where we're gonna find two to four acres anywhere in this town, but it's a challenge, and, and we're gonna certainly try to, to figure that out. Um, and then also station three, that's probably on a five to 10 year plan. Again, a 24 hour station, roughly 13,000 square feet, three bays, and again, two to four acres. Again, that's from the consultant. I wanna talk a little bit about staffing because I know there'll be questions about that. So in 2018, we had a maximum shift staff of eight people. That's all that served the community. And with the increasing runs in emergency or ambulance runs, as more and more ambulance runs come in, we pull from the engine to take the next ambulance run. So it creates some challenges for us. We had a minimum staffing of six, so we would go down to six. 58% of the time our shifts run at minimum. And that's just due to sick time, vacation, and injuries and all that other stuff. So 58% of the time we run at minimum. <clears throat> About 30% will run at um, seven and then the max shift is right around 10%. So you can see the challenges we are having. Every time as the runs increase, that's taking away from some other activity, whether that's training, fire inspections, maintenance, repair of equipment, um, to answer in the next emergency call. So, or taking staff out of areas that that's not their primary job to get on the truck or get in the ambulance and take the next call. 2019, uh, from recommendations of the NOVAC report, we added an additional staff member to each shift. So what that's done, it's allowed us to really answer the medic three call 
um, more frequently than we ever have in the past. So in 2020, uh, last year we received a SAFER grant. It's a federal grant that uh, helps uh, financially support fire departments in staffing. And we were able to get six uh, paramedic firefighters. They're going to start on March 9th. Their fire academy starts. And they will um, be assigned to the shift. So we're going to take the shift from 9 to 11. What that allows, it gets us a firefighter in the back seat of the fire truck, which was not very common. Um, so that's great to have that as a, as a kind of a guarantee. And then we're going to be able to staff three ambulances pretty consistently going forward. And then if the shift is at 10 or 11, we're going to be able to add to that. We're going to be able to get Medic 4 on the road or add a firefighter, an additional firefighter in the back of the fire trucks. So with that, turn it over. So we've, it's uh, about 7.35. We wanted to be wrapping up close to 8 o'clock. Uh, this is our question and answer time. Uh, we really would uh, like to see if we can confine our questions to the subject matter that we're here for tonight. Um, also wanted to tell you that uh, Jennifer's got a microphone. We are recording this and it's also Facebook Live right now as well. So we need to, uh, we need to have your question over the, over the microphone, but we're happy to take some questions. Um, Andy Brown, uh, 5512 Park Place in Edina, and my family's been in Edina since the Eisenhower administration, so we've been here quite a time. And um, I'm not questioning your guys' service or your department's service, but I'm really, really questioning the plan on how are you going to do those fire stations. I, I'm not questioning the finances or the taxes or anything like that. I'm worried about the service. My mom's 70. She has kidney disease. My son is two and a half. He's got a heart condition. And quite frankly, um, a five year wait for fire station number three is unacceptable to me. And it will determine whether I stay in a diner or not. And um, I think you've even admitted where you're going to find this land. I've come to the city council to tell them about where land opportunities are at 58th and France. And the mayor said, well, it's not the right size, it's not the right location. And that's the kind of feedback. I really want to see a plan that gets you to where those three fire stations need to be and in a quicker time period. And you know, we've paid taxes for a long time. I'll continue to pay taxes. I want that service. I don't want to be going to funerals. So that's kind of where it stands. And as far as the police chief, you know, I apologize. I know you can't talk about what happened in Ridgefield, but um, that was really disappointing. As a long-term resident, what happened there um, wasn't the Adina way. So I just want to express my thoughts on those, so. Any response? Did you have a question? Were you responding to those comments or just keep going? Keep going. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dave Frankel, and Dinah resident. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, as we stand right here, you mentioned, the fire chief mentioned mutual aid. Uh, this building, the closest fire stations in Minneapolis, and most of, as you're familiar, response times, fire response times in the northeast quadrant of Edina don't meet national standards. And I'm wondering why Minneapolis Fire Department has not put on automatic mutual aid to come to assistance on 911 calls. They're you know, only minutes away from 50th and France. Their station up on <coughs> 50th and Uptown is, is about a half a mile. And as you're well familiar, on a mutual aid call, they have to come. I've talked to the Minneapolis Fire Department. They're more than eager to come over here, and they've done it in the past on a very low volume basis. But for example, the unfortunate accident of the young girl getting hit at a school bus stop, Minneapolis Fire Department was equal distance to the Edina. Fortunately, I don't know the circumstances, but the Edina ambulance was close to that accident. But the Minneapolis uh, Fire Station was the closest station to that accident, and they were never called. And as a resident, the closest fire station to my house, not too far from City Hall, is the Minneapolis Fire Department. And why aren't, isn't Edina using Minneapolis on mutual aid? They hardly ever come over here. Can you answer that question? Well, I'll, yeah, I'll give it a try. So we 
do have mutual aid with Minneapolis. They're in our alarm assignments. Um, we do not have auto aid with any community. So some communities have automatic aid. And what that is, as the dispatcher's taking in the call, the dispatcher and the system will automatically dispatch other fire departments. We don't have that. Right? We don't utilize that. We use mutual aid because we rely on our dispatchers to take in the information and then dispatch the call. And they have some latitude to do what's called an initial alarm or a first alarm assignment. They can do that. Again, that has to meet kind of not every 911 call is, is created equal. So these are, you know, comes in as a, you know, a structure fire, something like that, right? The dispatcher would determine if that's an initial alarm or a first alarm, okay? And then we have box alarms for each quadrant that would bring in certain fire mutual aid companies to help assist us. Minneapolis is in that system, but we do not call we do not call mutual aid for just everyday 911 calls because once you send out a mutual aid request, I lose com complete control of that. There's no guarantee that Minneapolis is going to send assistance from that fire station. I don't know where it comes from. That, that particular fire station could be out on a run somewhere um, and they could, however they want to do that, dispatch that. EMS is a great example. Um, we get EMS as assistance. Once we request assistance from Hennepin County Medical Center, that's a common ambulance service we'll use for assistance. It's completely up to them where they're going to pick that ambulance in their system to respond to uh, our city. The chief, there's a second Minneapolis fire station that would back up 50th and Upton that's over on Excelsior Boulevard, which again is the second closest fire station to this area, but also the, the station at 50th and Upton has an empty bay. Is it ever, I realize a lot of political issues, and it's not as easy as I'm saying, but they're more than open to a discussion to use that bay to somehow help Edina. I mean, we have an, a need today. Five to 10 years out is really not acceptable, and I don't understand why there isn't a discussion on the table to look at that empty fire station, and they're using it for storage. I've talked to them, I know the issues. But they're open to putting an Edina fire truck in there or putting a Minneapolis fire truck that's staffed by Edina. I mean, there's a lot of political issues. It's not that easy, but you're basically saying there's a risk analysis. You have no control over that station. But a, a maybe is better than somebody coming later. And as you're all aware, and the city managers pointed out, a slow response time is okay. A slow response time that does not meet national standards is not okay. I'd rather take the risk of a Minneapolis truck showing up before any Dyna truck than not calling at all. They seldom come over here. I can't find a Minneapolis firefighter that can remember coming over to Edina. And they actually come shopping at Lunds. They could be a block away from a fire, they'd never get a call on Edina. I mean, to me, it's unacceptable. You're basically saying, we don't have control, so we're not going to risk the call. But why does Minneapolis do automatic response into, into Richfield? As far as I know, they don't. Well, they it's used to. They actually just stopped system. it. Yeah, they and they're to. in Richfield's box alarm assignment. And I, I can't tell you where in their box alarm assignment they have Minneapolis fire respond. But it's not on a, a daily response. Yeah, it used to be. I had a little bit of uh, trouble following your graphics. Uh, the lines were numbered, but uh, as try as I might, I couldn't see the actual number of uh, officers, and it would be helpful if that was actually in there. Now, maybe I missed it, but uh, uh, you've got a safer grant. The city has a safer grant, and that's part of the way that FEMA wastes money. I mean, over at fire station number one, you've got a $500,000 communications truck that FEMA gave you as a grant. And I'm sure that uh, Middle Eastern terrorists are just shaking in their burkas because it's there. But nonetheless, you've got it. Uh, you recently bought a new uh, armored car uh, to replace the old armored car. Uh, but I guess the question is, you know, this city likes to spend money and they like to waste money. 
I was here when the Novak report was presented by the people from Chicago, and uh, they laid it out. And uh, <clears throat> then at the end, the mayor said, well, you know, this is just for the future 10 years out. Within 14 months, you've hired all of the people, both fire and ambulance and police, that the Novak report uh, suggested. Uh, you just said that uh, that third fire station is 10 or 15 years out. I don't think so. I think we'll have it in three years. And I'll give you a little helpful hint. Uh, fire station or ambulance station number two, you've got enough room with the land there. That station is back, way back from York Avenue, set back. You could build a building to house fire and ambulance vehicles there. You don't have to abandon that building and move it someplace else. But uh, that's what you're going to do because uh, the mayor and the city manager like to spend money. Now, uh, the SAFER grant doesn't last forever. And when it expires, I don't know whether that's two years. Uh, is it two or three? Three. Three-year grant. You aren't going to lay off any of the people that you hired. You're going to keep them. And so the net result of the last 15 months is we've added $3 million. You know, the cost of the... The, the new fire engines replacement uh, well before their useful life has expired, uh, the cost of the two new, a new ambulances, the armored car. You know, uh, the city has grown by about 6,000 people in uh, the last seven or eight years. Uh, your graphic that showed the quadrants of the city, you could embellish that a little bit. The, the reason there are so many calls in the southeastern quadrant is because the quadrant is filled with uh, facilities, nursing homes, assisted living homes, uh, homes for the elderly before they need to get into nursing homes and assisted living homes. And these people who are in their 80s plus are in failing health, like all of us will be when we reach that age. And so they have heart attacks and strokes, and they fall down and break their hip, and uh, they forget to turn off the stove. All of those things uh, require uh, responses from the fire department. But le let's not attribute the, uh, the, the frequency of calls to just density, the high-rise living. It's, it's the fact that this along York Avenue for historical reasons, south of Highway 62, there's a, a concentration of for-profit and non-profit buildings that service people in the last 25 years of their lives. And they require a lot of medical attention. Now there's a, a facility, I take a little time here, but yeah, can can we can you get closer to your question, Mr. Okay, Williams? We my, want to make sure everybody is, has a chance to ask you're, questions. You're adding staff and equipment much faster than the general population increase, and uh, it you know no business would abandon uh, facilities, buildings, or equipment when less than half of its useful life is there. But that's what this city is doing, and that's, that's fine. You have ribbon cuttings and big smiles and all the rest of it, but it costs money, and you're, you're raising the taxes uh, much, much faster than the incomes are going up for most people. So uh, I, I just wonder whether there's any limit to the amount of money that you can spend or will spend uh, and whether anybody's response, you know, responsible, maybe, maybe we shouldn't allow any more nursing home or assisted living homes to be built in Edina. There, uh, you know, there's, it's, it seems like we're, we're creating some of our own problems here, so. Okay. Thank you. I'll take the Novak study on police. <clears throat> Uh, the Novak study, when they did their study, it was uh, studying our data in 2013, 14, and 15. They studied the data over 2016 and then presented to City Council early 2017. At that time, they were recommending 
for the police department to keep our proactive rate at where they believed it should be, where it was in 2013, was at 49%. To do that, we would have to hire seven officers and then hire an additional two officers per year until the calls for service stabilized again. As a chief, I realized there was no way we would be able to add seven officers. Um, in the next, next budget cycle, we did get approved to add two positions. And in the current budget cycle for 21, or 2020 and 2021, we'll be adding an additional two positions. So I'll be four of the seven that they initially recommended and then not two per year after that. So we are nowhere near what the recommendation was. I, I don't recall that, so I'd have to hear that tape. I do. Okay. Hi, I'm Lori Groats. Oh. It doesn't sound loud, but evidently you're mm -hmm. hearing me. Hear um, my husband and I have lived here since 1979, so 41 years now. If you need more police officers and you're short a few, have you considered taking your police officers off of the freeways and putting them into the neighborhoods and dealing with service calls there? Um, I had a discussion one time with a state patrol officer and we started to talk about uh, police stops and so forth on the freeways and the gentleman said to me, the um, state patrol officer said, well, Highway 100 and Crosstown, he says, we have officers that are assigned to those roads. He says, Edina has chosen to go in and cover those roads. He says, they don't need to cover those roads for speeding. He says, the state patrol handles that area. But he says, they've gone in and he says we would prefer to be handling Highway 100 in Crosstown, but Edina has chosen to do that. So to me, um, as a business person, I would think that it would make a little bit more economic sense if you're short of officers, if those freeways are already being covered by another agency, by the state of Minnesota that taxpayers are paying for, why don't you put your police officers in the community so that we have more community policing? Good question, uh, fair question. Um, officers are assigned to a patrol or to a zone, and we have four different zones divided by the freeways, just as we were talking about earlier. But uh, we don't position officers on the highway to patrol just the highway. They have their entire zone to patrol. We are on the highways quite frequently when responding to calls because that's gonna be the quickest route to get to a call. Um, officers also do traffic enforcement out on the highway, but that is not their primary objective. Um, I have uh, talked to State Patrol. I've seen state troopers make stops on Highway 62, Highway 100, and 169. Um, I've never had State Patrol come to me and saying, Chief, uh, don't have your officers out there, that's ours. Um, I haven't had that happen, but uh, we don't station officers on the highway for enforcement. Well, I'm sure they wouldn't come to you and, and say that, but anybody that's lived in the city for a long time, you're going to know that routinely officers are on sitting at the, on the north ramp uh, over there by the community center, mm -hmm. going to the north, they get off on the next exit, they make a loop and they sit and they do it over and over again. The other night I came home from a city meeting and uh, I was getting, uh, I was on Eden and getting on to Crosstown going to the south there over by Our Lady of Grace. And there's kind of a more of a dangerous intersection there. You've got a couple of roads coming together. Well, now you've got an officer that's sitting on the shoulder 
and he's sitting and waiting and he's watching for somebody to go north to stop him for speeding. I've seen him before sitting all the time underneath the bridge over by uh, 70th and Highway 100. Uh, and those are hard to see at night. They sit there with their lights off. You can't see them. You're putting your officers at danger also besides the public. People know that you spend a lot of time on the freeways. I mean, we had an officer that won an award for giving the most speeding tickets ever in the state of Minnesota in Edina. Anybody that's lived here for a while knows. Anybody knows if you're going down 50th Street when you get down to Utley Park, you better slow down because chances are you might have an officer sitting in there too. They used to have them all the time sitting on Xerxes, um, just a couple of blocks north of 62nd uh, at a 90 degree angle. It's a 30 um, mile an hour zone there. They're sitting there too. You do have people that are assigned just to be giving, to watch the speeding on there. And so if you're really short, pull them off and, and put them into the community. Thank you. So back to, uh, back to that as far as Traffic is our number one complaint by our residents as far as speeding, stop signs, the residential roads, secondary roads. Um, many years ago, uh, we had a traffic division that was put into our budget of three officers who do work strictly traffic. So we do have officers whose primary assignment is to work traffic, not necessarily on the highways, but the areas that you talk about, the secondary roads and that. And it's primarily because traffic's our number one complaint. I think that traffic enforcement, um, it makes safer roads. Um, we have a well-known reputation for don't speed in Edina. I'm sure all of you have heard that um, on the news at some point or another. But, um, but it's because it's a, the number one complaint from our residents. I, I do keep an eye on the traffic tags that are written, the citations that are written. and. Currently, we're at uh, in a 30 mile an hour zone. Our average citation written is 16 miles over the limit. So that's 46 and a 30. On the freeways, it's 18 miles over the limit. So is speeding a problem in Edina? Is traffic a problem in Edina? Yes, it is. And when our residents make it their number one concern for me in our non-demand time, we should be addressing the number one concern of our residents. We have time for uh, one more question, and then we'll wrap up tonight. Hi, I, I'm Barry Rosenthal. Um, Chief, I'm glad to see that you're putting a, a big emphasis on de-escalating tense situations. Um, just one comment. Um, it used to be the thin blue line. Now it seems like police are all ninja black. Maybe the, I would like to see a less aggressive looking uniform. Just that's a personal comment. My question is really, um, I, and I don't know if it's governed by state law or by, by city policy, but um, those, the body cams, um, are those public records, or those, those videos, or how are those used? Uh, we have it in our cute frequently asked questions there. Most of the data that will be collected on the body cams will be considered private. Uh, some of it will be confidential if it involves an ongoing investigation and that, but it's going to be considered private data for the most part at the end of the day. There are some circumstances where if it involves uh, officer use of force, that once the entire investigation is done, that would become public. But uh, we've tried to focus for the most part, it's going to be private data. So if you're not involved in the situation, you won't be able to get a copy. So as far as the uh, ninja look, um, what that is, and it's not just Edina, it's, it's everywhere. It's, everywhere. Um, it's not the look, it's load-bearing vests, and it's with all the back injuries from cops carrying a leather belt around them with all this gear on for 30 years, and all the back injuries. Um, they found that these load-bearing vests where they can start distributing some of their equipment up a little bit higher and not around their waist is uh, healthier for their back. So that's the reason for it. <laughs> a different color. Uh, ours are navy blue, so they kind of match our uniform. Well, on behalf of, of Chief Nelson and Chief Schmitz and, and uh, Jennifer Benerat, our Director of Communications, I want to thank you for coming out to our first uh, town talks on a cold uh, winter's evening. Uh, we'll be here a little while. If you have any questions you want to pose to us, uh, sort of 
outside of uh, Facebook Live. And if you have any questions or, or comments, uh, we have this. We'll, we'll have something of it better, um, better together at Dinah.com as well. So thanks for your time tonight.